First of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, to be here and hosting this session. And thank you, every thank you, everyone, for being here, making the time. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, over the next 45 minutes, we'll be having uh, having an interesting discussion on the sustainability and the future of EV within that. Right. Um, let me maybe just start with uh, setting the context for this uh, discussion. Uh, we all know uh, climate, is, climate change is a very real and important imperative. And even though the Paris Accord uh, sets the target at uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, we are way away from that. And uh, a lot of uh, new innovation and a lot of changes has to happen if we were to meet, meet or even better the targets. Uh, now, why is it important? Uh, you know, automotive industry contributes uh, close to around 17% um, of the total greenhouse emissions on CO2, uh, and of which road transportation is uh, almost close to 12%. Uh, so 12% of CO2 emissions is really road transportation. Um, across, uh, across the world, uh, automobile manufacturers have really uh, been at the forefront of a shift towards, uh, uh, you know, electric vehicles, which is uh, lower in terms of emissions, uh, and hence they are doing their bit. Uh, a lot of the OEMs have already uh, announced that they want to move to, um, you know, 100% electric vehicles and removing ICE by either by 2030 or 2035 or 2040. And many of the governments, um, you know, recently at COP26, uh, about 30 odd governments, including the US and the Canada, uh, have actually announced that they're going to uh, move towards 100% zero emission vehicles by 2040. Uh, now that, of course, presents a huge opportunity uh, for this industry uh, and also certain challenges, uh, given that, uh, you know, it's going to be a fundamental shift, which we haven't seen in many decades. Uh, so with this, uh, you know, I'll uh, start the discussion um, with, uh, with all of you here, uh, which represents, uh, you know, many of the OEMs in both the two-wheeler and three-wheeler space. We have uh, charging infrastructure representation as well as finance. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let, me, let me maybe start with uh, getting an OEM perspective first. Uh, and I know we represent, uh, so, so Amitabh, Ram, um, Varun and Saurabh, uh, maybe one by one. Um, as OEMs, you know, how are you seeing the evolution uh, of EVs going forward? And, uh, you know, what are some of the things that keeps you interested? Maybe I'll start with uh, Amitabh. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, so it's clear, you know, the reasons that you gave are very, very clear. Right? Uh, we need to do something about road transportation. We cannot wait for the incumbents to make change happen. It's very clear. So if that's going to be the case, then startups will have to you know, disrupt, and the disruption will happen from the fringe. So um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a computer science Greek, right? and uh, I'm, I'm making cars uh, or electric vehicles. Um, you know, it's, you just have to get into it. I think uh, the future for transportation is all electric. There is right. no doubt about it. So the drive trains will be electric. The source of that power could be different. Right. So we, we're certain that uh, innovation has to happen. And we'll have to lead that innovation. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're still in the beginning of the curve. Um, the adoption has just started. Um, and I think what is going to really make it uh, take off is the is the is the total cost of ownership that is very becoming very visible to users so i mean people are really realizing that hey electric vehicles are much cheaper to own much cheaper to run and much cheaper to maintain over the course of years so and i think once that starts to get hold and and, and that message gets across to people i think it's going to be a very exponential transition to electric electric and and also what hap what what drives the growth again is the large number of uh, people opting for electric makes the cost, you know, you know, a scale of economies start coming into picture. Uh, what we saw in solar uh, panels, where it started off at exponential, I mean, at, at a very high price, unsustainable to really compete with, uh, with the conventional sources of energy. 
just drop by a factor, a magnitude within years. And, and now it has become an extremely sustainable option to start uh, power sources, uh, although they, it has its own challenges. But it's, again, the cost has come down dramatically. And I think the same thing will happen with electric vehicles as well, where the total cost of ownership will definitely drive the adoption and, and the exponential um, you know, growth of that. Right. Maybe, um, sort of? Uh, hello. Yeah. So uh, I, th I agree with both Amitav and Varun. Uh, on both the different points that they made. Uh, incumbents uh, will take their time and I think uh, and that startup has definitely done a phenomenal job. I think all the founders out there, are, uh, I, I think in pushing the industry, making customer believe that electric is possible uh, and it can be done today uh, with whatever limitations that we have in the ecosystem. The other point, uh, total cost of ownership is definitely very important and that's one of the reason why Euler had taken a fundamental bet on the commercial vehicle. Uh, pollution was one of the reasons I think where you started your conversations with. Uh, but at the end of the day, customer believes, uh, uh, I mean, in the total cost of saving uh, ownership and that is saving the experience that they are getting from the product. Uh, so there, what I feel over the next couple of years, uh, you will see more mature, better stable, better experience will happen in the product. Uh, I mean, some of the early journey had been, uh, I would say, a bit challenging. Either your financing ecosystem or the service ecosystems were still getting developed. Uh, the products were still getting matured. Uh, so next two to three years, I think this... Uh, rate of change that is happening will further get amplified and your tipping point might be sooner than what we all are anticipating. Absolutely. Ram, your perspective on this? Yeah, good afternoon everyone. Um, the, the future I see is very bright, not too far, I'm saying near future is very bright. Uh, obviously the government policies and uh, the government is pushing to meet its own goals for, uh, for a cleaner planet. And uh, again, TCO is a big driver. There's a big pull from the market for the TCO perspective. But there are certain few things that uh, kind of um, probably uh, didn't help the, the, the speed of growth, the safety number one. Mm -hmm. The past six months with the government policies and also new technologies coming in the battery, the uh, significant pro progress has been made in the industry. So that actually should give a good comfort for the customers. And then the affordability, a lot of new battery technology coming in with the charge density, uh, with higher charge density like solid states and, uh, and also um, having uh, a different business models as well to make it more affordable uh, with swap solutions or leasing uh, that will also be a huge catalyst moving forward to to get the get this growth at a rapid pace. So I, I I'm very bullish on this, and uh, that's the reason we're all here in this business. So definitely, there I, I see a lot of positive things. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. You, let me move to um, Amit. Uh, Amit, we all obviously uh, know that charging infrastructure plays a key role in this whole EV transition. Um, you know, you've been working on, on this space uh, for a long time and of course, you know, moving towards more technology-enabled charging infrastructure. Um, how do you see technology playing a role in this whole EV transition um, on the charging infrastructure side? So first of all, good afternoon everyone. So see, uh, Chetan just mentioned that uh, we don't have the, those many years now to ramp up to uh, reach to a greener uh, planet. And uh, while everything is important, technology is going to be the most important in achieving that. So right from the battery swapping to EV charging to the technology in the EV, standardization is something which is going to be very important and technology plays a very crucial role on that. So while the standardization comes, the scalability is also, I, I believe, and uh, I, I, I assume many of you would also, that scalability is also going to be driven by technology. So this is what uh, technology has to offer and it's not limited to just the software on the embedded, the designs of the chargers, the vehicles, everything, the experience, 
and uh, finally like everyone mentioned that the total cost of ownership so technology is going to play there as well absolutely thank you so much amit uh, my next question to pankaj uh, look we we've, we've all spoken about total cost of ownership which with evs over a period of 5 to 7 years of usage is definitely lower uh, but we also know that the upfront cost is more as of now uh, both for the vehicles in itself as well as setting up the charging infrastructure so in your opinion you know how can financing uh, be a key enabler to this uh, transition uh, good afternoon everyone uh, thank you thank you for inviting me and it's great to be part here so when we talk about financing i think so the biggest risk to a financer comes in the quality of the product the risk on the product today we are talking about that there is a standardization which is needed in charging or probably product technologies are changing and it is a financial risk for any financiers who is doing risk in this category but today as a ecosystem we are funding everything in terms of ecosystem so probably be it vehicle be it charging infrastructure be it swappable battery so we have a proven track record financing all of them but we look at different use cases and we finance specific use cases in those category so today uh, we we probably when we talk about charging infra the biggest client that we have financed to is blue smart we probably have given around close to 250 charges to them right. because there is a fixed revenue utilization which blue smart can do it uh, probably when we talk about in terms of cars, we probably have given it to lithium as well. We are giving it to Blue Smart also today. So probably, you know, there are different assets which can be financed to different people and different segment. And IAC EV financing is a different, it's working fantastically well in the last mile connectivity as of right now. Mm -hmm. And in charging and in particularly in terms of battery swapping, where it is a B2B business, there is a scope of doing it but very limited people are able to create a charging infra and make it utilized by in a public mode so there is a revenue assurance goes up and down so that's a place where financer cannot enter right. and that's the normal risk that because of which there are very limited people in the finance domain when it comes to ev financing Thank you, Pankaj. Maybe I'll continue with you uh, for one more question related to that. Um, you know, we are, we are all, uh, you know, we have eminent set of founders and, you know, early stage uh, companies, so as to call, um, even, even on the finance side, right? Uh, Chetan also mentioned that this is the decade or, you know, EV transition is being led by uh, new age companies. I mean, if you see globally, you know, Tesla, uh, BYD, uh, Neo, and even in India, many, many of you are creating that revolution. Uh, on the financing side, of course, you know, you are also an emerging new company. There are so many banks, NBFCs, who've been financing automotives for donkey's years. Uh, what differentiation do you think you can create in the market? So, so we started EV financing in 2016. So we were the early birds who started e-rickshaw financing. Uh, we currently hold a portfolio of around 18,000 live customers spread across 12 different states in northern part of the country. Now, what we have really believe in that technology is a play in EV financing. Today, the every asset that we finance is being fitted by an IoT device, correct? This gives the complete information on the utilization of the asset now most of the loans that we do whether it is an e-rickshaw whether it is an electric auto whether it is a charging station they are income generating or utilization has to be tracked in a very proper and a regular manner right correct if the person is generating the income the emi would come on time now using this iot device and this data we are creating our own artificial intelligence tool which is going to help us classify each and every loan and put it into a red yellow amber situation for us where we would be able to take a rather than a post-mortem approach we would be able to take a preemptive approach on handling npas or defaults or dpds what it is called in nbfc language 
in a much more effective manner. Correct? Which so we, course, yeah. we, we see that IC engine didn't have this kind of a play. But electric vehicles, infrastructure, everything has a play on this because technology integrates well. Correct? And if we know that this, let's say if we have financed any vehicle, if this vehicle is able to give a 95% uptime, a person is able to utilize X number of kilometers on a daily basis, uh, he is charging on time, uh, probably he is taking regular offs and probably would be highly likely to pay his EMI. Right. Correct. So looking at those parameters, our AI tool is going to probably put all these numbers together, which would help us to grow faster and faster. Right. right. And of course, you know, the traditional banks have been a little wary of... So uh, traditional is always driven from follow-ups. Yeah. Uh, as a whole, as a NBFC, we are a group of NBFC and we hold multiple licenses. Even the second thought that we are also probably playing on, uh, where NBFC have to probably take a leap is collections. So we we recently got a, a PPI license in our holding company. So we are going to implement a valid based system, and we would be one of the financings people who are probably doing all the commercial income generating loans. So in that sense, we would love to collect EMIs through valid on daily basis from our customer. Right. Correct. And and that's and that's going to be driven by IoT immobilization and a prior uh, information on daily pattern on his driving. So I think so that is a some level of innovation that we are trying to do differently from any other NBFCs uh, or probably doing differently in the EV as a sector. Wonderful. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, my next question is uh, more on the technology side. So I'll ask, let's say, Varun and Ram to give their perspectives on that. Uh, there's so much innovation happening globally on just the battery itself, which is the heart of the uh, of the EV battery as well as the motor. Uh, there's of course you know the different chemistries plus new innovation happening on the solid state, sodium ion, and everything. Uh, what are the two or three things you are more excited and looking forward to from 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 let's say the next five years perspective? So yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. So I think battery chemistry is where a lot of the research is happening and, and there is a lot of scope for us to reduce the cost and, um, and, and thereby encourage uh, uh, more adoption. I think uh, some of the very challenging, I mean, very exciting things um, that are happening are around solid state. Um, of course, that also involves lithium, which is again a, a, a fairly um, expensive metal right now. Uh, but uh, we've also seeing uh, we're also seeing sodium and um, and and aluminium and and, and zinc um, gel come up, but most of them are still at a stage where they are good for stationary storage. But uh, for automotive uh, grade batteries, there is still a lot of research that needs to happen and, and a lot of validation and, and commercialization that needs to happen. Um, but one thing is for sure, I think the NMC days are uh, kind of numbered. Um, it, it, it's uh, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see um, ferrophosphate again, you know, ca catch the steam, and also uh, manganese ferrophosphate la LMFP, which is which is really promising some good results, and 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 some of the uh, lithium-ion ma manufacturers have adopted it and started commercially producing them. Uh, it will be very interesting to see those things uh, uh, hit the market and and, and start giving results. Um, th th there is definitely uh, hydrogen, which is which is going. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fairly you know looking forward to that being a solution for heavy commercial vehicles. Uh, but then again, that's not just a matter of technology, but also a large amount of investment that has to go into the infrastructure to support that. Um, that that is not. I mean, it's more of a chicken and egg story there than a technical problem to solve. Uh, but it'll be very interesting to see the new technologies and come and disrupt the existing markets right now. Thank you. Uh, you can have a fast charging, uh, which also helps the uh, affordability for the customer and uh, especially for people who are financing, uh, the weakest link in the EV is the battery pack and uh, the, even our customers ask, the first question they ask even they, before they buy our two wheelers is uh, when do I need to change my battery? Right. So uh, that 
that all get eased out with the technology and uh, fast charging. Uh, so our goal at Greaves is to build a battery pack that can last the life of the vehicle so you don't have to change. So that's what we're all striving to, so are my colleagues here. So I, I see uh, that playing a major role. The second thing is a sodium ion. There is also a lot of investments going in sodium ion globally, but unfortunately we're not there yet for charge density wise. But uh, again, there are players who have proved out some, uh, uh, some prototypes which has uh, uh, charge density similar to an NMC, uh, but a uh, little farther away. So I see that uh, with the sodium ion, obviously, uh, it's also much safer and a rapid charging uh, capabilities available. So with these two, I see a bright future for, uh, for the EV technology. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So there, fundamentally, this question depends on who you are asking to. I think there, you'll get different answer. If you ask this question to the R&D team and the technology team, you'll get all of this answer of LTO to sodium ion, zinc air, lithium air, all of that. Like, all of that is true. Uh, some has some safety, some has different costs, some has charging time, all of this, like uh, energy density, volumetric, uh, uh, all, all possible. The other side is your customer, right? Like when you ask them and when you think about the business model, then your questions are very different. What is available today at scale, right? What is safer and economically viable? Yeah. Uh, what has like after five years, I can still predict a secondary value. What my finances are willing to underwrite. Yeah. What as an OEM I'm willing to underwrite because customer uh, commercial vehicle runs for seven, ten years, so I need to underwrite these risks as a technology and product risk. We need to step forward and write that. So depending on who you ask, also this answer changes. Like for instance, some of the uh, LFP, NCA, NCM, those are fairly stable. Uh, I would say supply chain is fairly stable as well. The cost structures, though during COVID it has gone up and down. I think our financial ecosystem and uh, our manufacturing ecosystem has uh, stabilized a bit. So next five years, I still see some of this pushing a lot. But on the innovation side, you will have everything from sodium ion to lithium air to combinations of these also, like supercapacitor and primary battery pack, primary and power cells together. So you will have these combinations. So Answers are also depending on who you ask. Absolutely, I think Varun has just yeah. taken the mic, so let me. No, I, I just wanted to add one more thing. So uh, we're all excited about the, uh, the new technology and the new chemistry that's gonna replace uh, lithium ion. There's one more thing I wanted to add, where um, there's a lot of technological advancements that are happening on recycling the lithium ion batteries that we already have. Um, what that enables us to do is really realize the uh, terminal value of the lithium ion battery right now, and kind of discount it for the customers today. So I think a lot of the progress is happening there where we can just recycle them and, and put it back on the road uh, because the metals are same. And it, what, what happens is the internal, you know, the anode and cathode and the electrolyte layer that degrades. It can be, if, if it can be re, you know, recycled effectively and, and maybe, you know, it may, may made the cost a lot lower, we, we could potentially look at a fairly cheap battery right now today. Absolutely. Amitabh, you want so, you know, um, maybe because I come from the software domain, I always talk about software. I think uh, we missed that piece. I think everyone focuses on the hardware side. If you look at the system-wide efficiency of the usage of an electric vehicle, you'll realize that uh, driver and driving behavior uh, matters a lot in the overall efficiency matrix. And the only way you can override this and make EVs better and successful will be through software. I think hardware, everyone will have the same batteries, everyone will have the same motors. I mean, at, at one point, it is going to happen, yeah. right? So, so how do you distinguish? I mean, there's a lot of sensors happening. Any failure that's happening today is largely because of software, because software did not catch it. Right. Even if there's a fire, I don't blame the cell, I don't blame the battery, I blame the BMS software. So I think there's a lot that will happen in that space, V2B, V2I, there's so much happening, chat GDP. It's going to change a lot of things. Uh, I do, I'm very bullish on the software side. I do feel that that is going to be the big differentiator in the years coming forward, yeah. Right. Maybe let me just carry on from there, uh, Amitabh. Uh, look, the field for 
EVs and for all of you is also not just India, right? It's global. Uh, the product that you make here and of course, you know, Indian companies on the two-wheeler and three-wheeler side, of course, India is a big market and we export quite a lot, not so much on the passenger cars. But, um, you know, what role can India play in this whole EV revolution uh, in terms of, uh, especially the software capabilities, which we traditionally have been very good. Uh, so what role do you think India can play in this? And maybe I'll ask the same question after that to, to Amit. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, we can play the, a very pivotal role in all of this, really. Uh, I mean, uh, Chetan was standing here, right? 1999, we had a production-ready full electric vehicle in this country. I mean, Tesla wasn't even born at that time, right? It's a different matter what happened. The, the important thing is innovations are... You know, we are born entrepreneurs in this country, right? right? I will be an entrepreneur, right? And there are many, many people who will be entrepreneurs. I think the important thing is that now the ecosystem is also coming to support these entrepreneurs. Right. And hence, innovation is bound to happen. I think we are one country where we've realized, I think, I don't like the word Jugaad at all. Uh, we've realized that innovation is very important. Innovation for our geography is very important, and we can always extend that to a global solution. So when we are doing things, whether it's battery, motors, controllers, software side, we have a very, very good base to start off, right? And I do believe that, um, you know, if we, if we really put our heads together, I am certain that we can be a very strong hub, not just on the manufacturing side. So we can be a very, very big hub for manufacturing in India you know, for um, EVs and EV components, definitely. But I think overall, in terms of exporting from here, I do believe that there's a very good opportunity for us. Um, we have a lot of lithium deposits also, by the way. So, uh, I would say that, see, a country like us, who is a, a software talent pool, and a country like us, who is a non-oil producing country, and country like us, with a lot of... Uh, new Gen Z, which are very much uh, environment cautious. So all these three factors are really going to make the products, especially the software, because software doesn't require a lot of logistics, which generally uh, hardware uh, has those challenges. So I'm, I'm very much sure and uh, aligned with what Amitabh said that we will see a lot of uh, Indian software EV products going global thanks to um, all the talent what we have and the motivation, the economical and the environmental motivation what we have. Thank you. Um, uh, Saurav uh, and, and let's say Amitav, uh, if you see in most countries, the EV transition, especially early on, has, uh, um, has really been accelerated through government policies. I mean, you you check whatever, the Europe, especially Scandinavian countries, China, and even India is doing its bit through fame subsidies, PLIs, and all that. Um, with the three-wheeler penetration at what it is, which is far higher than, let's say, all the other forms, um, what are some of the things that you feel the government should continue to do going forward? Or what are your expectations, let's say, from the government? Maybe, Saurav, if you can answer that, and, and Amitabh. Okay, uh, just on the previous one, very bullish on the India and uh, on the EV segment. Primarily, one of the reasons why I moved from US, came back to India, building it here. So we believe uh, definitely that uh, India will at least build a couple of companies in this uh, emerging EV uh, sector that will go out and rule globally as well. Right. Uh, on your question uh, on this EV and government, See, Dekhi, fundamentally what I believe is that last at least uh, five to six years, uh, the uh, there has been a consistency in the direction that electric vehicles are the future and they have been trying to do different policies that uh, whether it's fame, whether it's GST reduction and all of these, uh, both and we have seen that at multiple state level also. In general, theme is in the right direction. Uh, and that has resulted also, if you see the uh, penetration, uh, looking at just the three-wheeler cargo, uh, which is uh, where we have one of our products. 
Uh, last year, uh, it was around like March, 5% uh, of the electric cargo that were selling in India were uh, three-wheeler. Now roughly around 20% of what gets sold is three-wheeler, just the cargo. Delhi, uh, we see roughly 50% of what you're selling now in cargo is electric. In Bangalore, I think it's more than 30%. That is some of the number that I love. So uh, fundamentally, it's the economics. Why? And one of the reasons why Euler decided to take a bet on the commercial vehicle segment and we wanted to say, yeah, we want to build like something around like Tesla kind of experience for the global world in the commercial vehicle segment and why we should take a bet was fundamentally in the commercial vehicle segment, India, one road condition, payload, all of these are very unique. Uh, it's not the same. So you have to build something here to uh, take that. The second thing, uh, commercial vehicles are utilized a lot. Uh, hence, your saving gets multiplied much faster. So anything that you're paying in upfront cost for the similar performing vehicle, you end up receiving that sooner. So you start making more money within, let's just say, two years if your subsidies are not there, within one year if subsidy is there. So I think if subsidies or some of that goes away, it will, uh, gets uh, your total cost of ownership sits further, but it doesn't die out. And that is your fundamental reason. Yeah. So our, our major, I would say, uh, what, uh, what we had said to government as well in different forums, is that uh, if they can continue this fame, maybe uh, in whatever shape and size, it doesn't have to be like at the same, uh, you can always wish for ki, give yeah. us more money and more money. Uh, but uh, India has need, plenty of needs, right? Like, uh, and uh, they have to allocate money to all the segments. So what we believe is even tapering is okay, but continue this forward till uh, some of these uh, ecosystem and everything grows. Second, I think what they have done really good is on the making sure the localization bit is not, uh, I mean, taken advantage. I mean, there's a solid sort of check on that right. because that benefits like company like us who are like pushing a lot right on the innovation side trying to build uh, uh, innovation that works for India works for the global scale whether it's in the battery whether it's in the electronics and also solving for that backward manufacturing right like so building at scale so that you can supply to these demand at scale and also uh, build quality product not just anything that w works uh, you built out of lab so uh, yeah, mainly if they can continue and directionally be there for the next one and a half year, even more, uh, I think it should be fine. Um, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so completely agree with Saurabh. I think it's important for the government to continue because the reason this policy came around was because battery prices were very high to bring parity. So until either PLI scheme oriented batteries were to show up in the market, I'm fine. You know, then they're manufactured in India and at a price point that India can afford. If it's not happening and lithium prices continue to soar, I think it's important for the government to consider it. Uh, they still have a lot of reserves on the money side. I don't think that is a challenge. Um, I, I think uh, perhaps they should also push the commercial banks all to start. Nothing against NBFCs, but I think commercial banks need to step in. Right. Uh, it's important, I, I think, from a financing of commercial vehicles. It's very, very important because that brings the interest rate down. Uh, it makes it better for them. I think the third thing is, to some extent, you know, transportation is a state subject. So policy koi banata hai, implementation, yeah. right? So I think it's very important for the states also to step forward and it's not just in the form of a stated policy, but also something that makes a difference on the ground and they should make a cognitive effort in, in making sure that really, uh, you know, change is happening. Otherwise, uh, it's a 20-page document and it's just floating around. Right. Yeah. Thank, right. You. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, I think we talked about India's role globally in this entire play. And uh, I think uh, in order to do that, uh, retailing uh, and nurturing talent is a, is a key uh, enabler. Uh, of course, what Germany has been able to do with, you know, all their German brands in terms of more the hardware talent and let's say Silicon Valley from a software perspective. Maybe if I was to ask Amit, you from a, uh, what can India do or what do India need to do in terms of just retaining the software talent? And of course, you know, Varun and Ram from a, from a hardware and uh, hardware talent perspective, because if we were to be successful, we really need to ensure that, you know, our talent stays. And of course, a lot of the talent, which in the global markets, China, 
US and all is there can actually come back because a lot of them are also Indian origin. So you see a couple of factors uh, play a role here. So first thing is that uh, having the talent associated with a cause like environment and keeping them involved in the actual implementation of that. Second thing is uh, the glamour associated to a particular career. So the more we talk about EV and the more we talk about EV at every stage, right from the uh, schooling uh, to engineering and uh, promoting people to take careers, not just in software, but designing the right batteries, materials, uh, everything there. And uh, then it comes to uh, the potential, like uh, how everyone has been talking about the potential which the Indian EV talent is going to have for the global market. So if we uh, can help uh, the new, uh, not only just entrepreneurs, but all the contributors uh, to this tech and the ecosystem to understand that what we all are going to do together. So all this is really going to make the uh, more talent to come to this uh, industry. Right. Yeah. Uh, s s something that, um, you know, contributed to a, a, an enormous is for uh, us to attract talent on bound share. The, the dockless business was the challenge and the opportunity um, that, that it presented. So when we were solving for dockless, um, the problem was enormous. I mean, we were putting unsupervised assets on the road where you could just pick it up anywhere and drop it off anywhere. And, and this was a challenge that, you know, the global companies were struggling to solve for. And there was no, you know, um, there was no solved, um, uh, you know, solution that was available from either the west or the east. So that was what really attracted the talent to the company. And, you know, everybody was motivated to, you know, figure out various aspects of this problem, break it down, solve it, see it work, and then, you know, really get that satisfaction from watching it grow. So and I think that's very similar to what we are uh, seeing today in attracting talent as well. The challenge out there is that, you know, hey, the, the environment is really, um, it's not doing well. Uh, so I think the 1.5 degrees is, is something that we've just blown right through. And the challenge is very real and the opportunity is, is, is pretty huge when we're solving it. So this is something that is really, um, you know, exciting people of great caliber to work on something. And then, of course, these are wonderful companies uh, where you can make a difference and see that happen on the daily life. Ram, you, you've actually transitioned from, from, from US to here. Uh, I mean, what prompted you and what do you think uh, can be the enablers to get a lot of the talent which is sitting out there back here? Uh, one of the, the best uh, thing that we found working for us is we are partnering with a lot of the universities. We actually partner with them at uh, the second year of their career students where we start giving out projects. We work collaboratively. And uh, so scout, we, we do scout talent across the globe. We do have expats joining us. We have uh, on the software side. But to, to make it more sustainable, the, the, the talent has to be bred in, in this country. And so and it has to start very early. So we, we partner and we do that. Apart from that, we also look at other industries, a mobile industry for any kind of connectivity user experience. There are a lot of talent in this country there. And also the appliance industry, which has been using the motors and controllers for a very long time. So uh, there are people out there. Uh, we just have to look, think a little bit outside the box. And, uh, and, but we are very passionate about becoming the breeding ground of talent in this country. So we do uh, work with the universities. Wonderful. Uh, my last question uh, to Pankaj, um, as a financier, you know, when you look at the sustainability topic, uh, EV is only one of the things, right? I mean, what are the other uh, technologies that you feel uh, from a financing point of view you are really looking forward to and will be interested going forward? So as a, a Muffin Green name suggests, what we are going to finance is only green. Currently, our out of 250 crore portfolio, all is 100% EV. So we do not do anything other than EV as of right now. But yes, we have intent to probably grow in the greener and the cleaner space itself. So it could be around funding projects which are in hydrogen, funding projects which are a, a solar-led uh, charging stations. Uh, 
looking at different models and different synergies which are clean and green and income generating opportunities. Thank you. Uh, so that's, those are the questions from me. I wanted to open up for the audience to see if we have any questions. Kindly if you can just uh, pass around the mic, someone. If I can request just, uh, can you please uh, share your name and your question and who, who is it addressed to? Hello, so my name is Krishna and then it's an open question, anybody can address. So apparently there are a good number of uh, articles and documentaries in recent days that says that EV is not so green and clean as we expect. Like uh, obviously the extraction of lithium from its ore, cobalt, cleaning the, pro I mean the process of cleaning it, making it into batteries, uh, and then uh, post-production, right? Uh, there are even reports saying that uh, when you compare, uh, like right in, in case of India, 60% of electricity comes from thermal power plant, right? So uh, there was a report that I was looking at recently which says the carbon footprint when you compare to a IC engine and an EV is less than 20%. So which totally voids the fact that EV is green and clean. How do you guys see it? Is it really clean or? Who wants to answer that? So I think so, uh, yes, it's a chicken and egg story that you know, probably you know we are moving to EV, at least vehicle, emission is tailpipe zero. So that emission is at least something that we are able to control at one level. It's a, it's a bigger problem to solve for. So probably, you know, we are at least solving at the vehicle level. Now there could be certain initiative which could be taken out that, you know, out of the 70% which is uh, electricity which is generated from the coal, it can slowly gradually move to uh, renewable sources of energy and moment it would start happening the impact would be larger and significant in number. Maybe I ask Amitabh to also share his perspective. <clears throat> sure, so your question is valid. Um, uh, I think because this is a new domain, a new technology, everyone is looking at it uh, under the microscope. It's not that any other industry is very clean. Um, I mean our shoes that we are wearing are made in sweatshops, you know, steel is not, I mean Let's not even get there, right? It's just that if five to six lakh people are dying in our country alone every year because of road transport pollution, boss, first we have to fix that problem. Five to six lakh a year. Realize one lakh people died in COVID, there was a national lockdown. Five to six lakh every year. So we have to fix the problem. I understand that there will be these kinds of things and they will get fixed. They will also get fixed over a period of time. But in the beginning, I think, you're absolutely right. There is no clean solution for it. India has gradually created more green electricity. Now we are at 42%, by the way. 42% of India's electricity is green. Um, we'll get there. Um, I think it will be a transition, but we will get there. Yeah. yeah. Any next question? Hello. So while the mainstream, mainstream adoption is a while away, the tech stack is still evolving, right? Whether it is on the battery side, you guys talked about how different new technologies are coming, whether it is on the charging protocol side or in the EV side. How much of a risk you see in terms of sunk costs or fixed investments that early stage companies are making and then the technology becomes obsolete few years down the line, even before mainstream adoption adopt, uh, arrives and nobody has yet made money on the previous tech stack. You know, uh, once again, I, I think over there, it's not that the current tech stacks are any bad. It's only going to get better. It's like an evolution in any other industry. So even if you have invested in that tech stack and that tech stack is going to deliver according to the warranties and on the basis of those warranties, everyone is making money in the process. Now, it's a different thing if the OEM is not able to support the warranty for whatever reason, whatever part it might be. If that is not the case, Right? If that is not the case, then in the ecosystem, considering the TCO benefits, I think if you look at it whichever way, you are going to make money. You can make a lot more money if the life of the vehicle is much longer. Right? Technology will always evolve. There's a reason why every year, even in ICE, there is a new vehicle that is every time, you know, there's some innovation that's going on. So innovation will happen. 
innovation will continue. It's only going to make the equation tilt more in the favor of, uh, you know, better financial uh, management, I would say. Also, some of the materials uh, may not really, you know, uh, invalidate the infrastructure investment that we already made. Uh, for example, if there is a little bit of change in the in, in the cathode or the, or the electrolyte material, it doesn't necessarily invalidate the entire assembly line that you put together to, you know, put the cells together. So, yeah, I mean, like, it is still years away before uh, something disruptive comes along and just, like, pretty much uh, rules everything out. But, but yeah, there is still a lo lot of investment being made, which have already started to realize today and, and that, that you don't have to wait for or hold the breath for the next technology to come in to, uh, to pay for it. Question, uh, just you. follow up. Uh, from a financing perspective, how much of a churn you expect in your portfolio companies because of companies making fixed investments and that not realizing, the ROI not realizing? So we do not finance companies, we finance assets which are used for income generation or any form, correct? So today we would not finance a company which is manufacturing any product. We are going to finance the final product and which is utilized and we would test out a cycle, take assurance that you know probably that is something is capable of generating the revenue for that end customer who is buying it. That is what we look at when we are financing EVs. So, uh, let me just add uh, one point to what you made. Uh, see, the key, technology evolution is happening. It's uh, happening across, right? We are building product, charging ecosystem, is somebody is setting up these charging stations. There are certain standards and everything is evolving, right? Uh, similar to your phone also or laptop, you had a uh, oh, single, uh, that pin kind of a connector, then micro USB, then you had USB B, C and all of that. And that evolution is also happening and you had interportability connectors in between. On OEM side as well, like when you think it is not going to be very different, maybe you won't have too many connectors, but in last five years I have seen uh, DC001, I had seen AC001, there is CCS, there is chart of Chimido, uh, Chidimo that gone right now. There are, so these will continue to happen. What Euler stands uh, has been so far is that uh, we need to isolate connectors uh, on one side. I mean, very, very particular to your use case that you were talking about charging station. Isolate connectors and your other battery and uh, remaining part of the vehicle. Make it interoperable so that tomorrow if, let's just say, uh, when we launched product in October of 21, we said Euler has a network of charging stations. Uh, you can use it at our charging station. Uh, six months down the line, a lot of, uh, couple of institutional customer came. They said, yeah, we also have our own network of charging station. We want to utilize those. We put in software update that uh, vehicle, they could connect to their charging station as well. Now when we are designing the next product, we are also bringing them into the part of the process. You also tell me where you are thinking of going so that when I'm designing, I can also be conscious of which one to put. So uh, this curve will evolve, I think, and it will be a sort of a collaborative approach where we all have to figure that answer. Can I just uh, request, in the interest of time, uh, probably take the last question, gentlemen over there. Hi, good afternoon everyone. This is Maxine Lewis from Magenta. Uh, this question is uh, largely uh, to Pankaji, but to everyone as well. Carbon credits, we're talking about sustainability. Uh, is carbon credits playing a role in the way EV financing and the cost of uh, operating it is coming through? And how are you looking at it from a financer perspective? Uh, uh, interesting question. So uh, we are focusing on uh, probably, I think so we would be India's first NBFC to trade carbon credits in uh, in next three months. That's what our first aim is. We have initiated all our process and probably we are doing it. Uh, this carbon credit, how once we have a validation of proof of selling or trading in carbon credit as an NBFC for the first time. Now that is something that we are looking at leveraging carbon credit to raise fund for EVs. Today, the cost of fund which is available for EV financing is much higher. Today, when we talk about to a lot of traditional banks, they would say that they do not have an EV financing policy. 
So we have a 100% EV portfolio. So they say that we cannot finance you. So today we have to raise funds from various impact-based institution or institutions which are funding climate-led funding. So that is what we are currently doing. But for us to really optimize the cost of fund is that, you know, how we can use and pass on the carbon credit benefit to our LPIs is the next level of thing that we want to intend to and bring down the cost of fund because today there are policies which are available for manufacturing or penetration of EV but there are no policy available for EV financing in the country. Correct? So if that, those are added in terms of, you know, everybody in the EV financing domain was demanding a priority sector lending. Correct? But it didn't happen. So I, I think so maybe next year. But the whole play is that, you know, the cost of fund until unless it goes down, uh, the penetration and the ripple effect uh, to end customer will not happen so soon. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, and thank you everyone for patiently listening. Let me maybe just end by saying, you know, the transportation industry, you know, over the many, many decades has obviously undergone many uh, innovations. Uh, but I would see, I would say, you know, the kind of disruption we are seeing now uh, has not been seen over the last maybe four or five decades. I mean, it's just a fundamental transition in the way we are looking at automotive industry. Uh, and uh, this has obviously given uh, a lot of the new age companies also an opportunity to play in this space and disrupt it. Um, and I would like to thank all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe I request a big round of applause uh, to all our panelists because these are the guys who are changing uh, and leading this revolution. Thank you very much.